Committee will come to order. First of all, I want to begin by thanking all the witnesses for their patience. Uh, we've had a uh, possibly historic number of votes today consecutively. We've been voting uh, pretty much for the better part of eight and a half hours. And so um, when there's a vote on in the House, it takes precedence over committee meetings. And as important as this committee meeting is, we wanted to come back here to continue and not to ask you to try to make arrangements when all many, many of you have already traveled a great distance. I've talked to many members uh, since, since, since every member has had a, uh, a great deal of difficulty in their own schedules. We're gonna, we'll have some members who will be coming in and out. But in the interest of, uh, of proceeding uh, efficiently and getting to the uh, witness, I'm going to uh, ask uh, those uh, f uh, members who are here to limit their opening remarks, uh, if they have any, to um, two and a half minutes. So uh, without, without objection, opening remarks uh, will be limited to two and a half minutes. Without objection, we'll be joined uh, by Senator Sanders. Uh, welcome, Senator. This is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. I'm Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Committee. The uh, uh, title of today's committee is After Injury, the Battle Begins, Evaluating Workers' Compensation for Civilian Contractors in War Zones. This hearing, After Injury, the Battle Begins, evaluating workers' compensation for civilian contractors in war zones, will evaluate workers' compensation insurance for federal contractors working overseas under the, the Defense Base Act, a little-known law passed in 1941 requiring all U.S. government contractors and subcontractors to secure workers' compensation insurance for their employees. Today's hearing focuses on why the men and women who support our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, many of whom are former members of the military, who re-entered the war zone based on a sense of patriotic duty or economic necessity, are coming home only to battle insurers, which deny them the medical care and benefits that American taxpayers have paid for, and why the same system richly rewards the insurance carriers for doing so. Over 35,000 contractors have been killed or seriously wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2002. In this subcommittee's investigation, we have heard story after story of injured workers coming home minus a limb or traumatized by war zone experiences seared into their psyche only to face the fight of their lives with their company's insurance carrier. AIG's record is of particular concern given the enormous federal subsidies it receives. It is already well known that AIG awarded hundreds of millions in bonuses to top executives who have led the company over the abyss. What this hearing will establish is that the same company has refused to pay the prescribed benefits to an injured contractor without first putting them through a protracted fight. CNA, which is a much smaller player in the Department of Defense uh, DBA market, nevertheless distinguishes itself for the lengths to which it will go to deny injured contractors' benefits and deny the existence of the phenomenon. This hearing, hearing will also demand to know where the Department of Labor has been since the start of the war to ensure injured workers are obtaining the benefits they deserve. The Department of Labor's Office of Workers' Compensation Programs, which oversees the program, is drastically underfunded and understaffed, and its ability to oversee this exploding program has suffered as a result. But it is also clear that under the previous administration, the Department of Labor took a hands-off approach to overseeing the DBA program. 
We're going to look forward to hearing from Deputy Secretary of Labor Harris on how the Department of Labor intends to increase its oversight role and help improve the delivery of benefits to injured workers. I hope this hearing will serve as an impetus for the reform of the Defense Base Act. And now I'm going to welcome and yield to our, our ranking member, uh, and I'd just like to say uh, thank you for being here. Before you arrive, Mr. Jordan, uh, we did unanimous consent that all members would have two and a half minutes, including us, in order to get to the witness, sure. and that uh, we welcomed uh, without objection and a unanimous consent for, Mr., uh, for Senator Sanders sure. to, to join us. So uh, we will um, uh, go to you for two and a half minutes. Uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Jordan from Ohio. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have a short statement. I'll uh, read fast. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich, for holding this hearing. I would like to uh, especially thank the contractors who are here with us today for their service to our country, and I look forward to their testimony. As the battlefield has evolved, contractors are indispensable. Without contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan, our troops would not have the food, shelter, supplies, or technology necessary to complete their 21st century missions. Defense Base Act or, or DBA insurance is statutorily mandated for contractors working on U.S. government contracts overseas. In recent years, we have seen cost increase as claims have increased. In a program as vast as DBA, there are going to be failings. We need to do everything we can to correct those failings. I hope this hearing will provide us an opportunity to survey the DBA program as a whole. It will be preferable to bring all parties, the Department of Labor, the employees, the contractors, and the five insurance providers to the table to discuss where reforms are needed. Today, however, we will hear from only two of the five providers and none of the employers. It's Congress's job to ensure the DOL has the resources and statutory authority to educate contractors about DBA, facilitate information sharing between the contractors and the insurance companies, answer questions of statutory interpretation, adjudicate disputes in a timely manner, and oversee employee rehabilitation programs. I look forward to hearing what initiatives DOL has in place to make the DBA program more efficient. Finally, I'd like to express my disappointment that the investigation leading up to this hearing has not been completed in a bipartisan manner. The Republicans on this committee were not included in any of the preparations or deliberations leading up to this hearing. Consequently, as we sit here today, we are not as well positioned to educate our members about this topic and, and not in a position to pass judgment on either the legitimacy of the contractor's claims or the propriety of the insurance provider's decisions. I hope we can work more closely together in the future. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to the testimony. I thank the gentleman. The Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings for two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this uh, critically important hearing to examine workers' compensation for civilian contractors in war zones. I requested this hearing following the April 17 publication of an extremely troubling report by the Los Angeles Times in conjunction with ABC News and ProPublica that the health insurance claims of civilian contractors who participated in military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan are being consistently denied. As you know, Mr. Chairman, civilian contractors, many of whom are veterans themselves, are serving an increasingly important role in achieving our mission in Iraq and Afghanistan. These brave men and women were alongside our uniformed service members, consistently displaying acts of hero heroism on behalf of the American people. Tragically, recent news reports indicate that our commitment to them does not parallel our commitment to their country. Just as there was public outrage over substandard conditions at the Walter Reed Medical Center, so too should we be appalled by the stories we hear today from civilian contractors who were injured on the battlefield and then abandoned here at home. As you know, Mr. Chairman, the Defense Base Act, uh, the DBA, requires contractors and subcontractors to purchase workers' compensation insurance for employees working overseas. The insurance purchase must cover medical care and disability payments for workers injured in the performance of job duties. It must also provide health death benefits for the families of employees killed on the job. The costs of insurance premiums paid by the contracting firms are then built into the price of the contract between the contractor and the federal government. Right now, there are more than 31,000 current and continuing civilian injury claims, as well as more than 1,400 claims for death benefits. The American International Group, AIG, and other insurers have received some $1.5 billion in premium payments while paying out $900 million in compensation and expenses. What a deal. According to the April 17th article, uh, AIG is a primary insurer retained by contracting firms handling some 90 percent of civilian claims filed in war zones in, two, in 2007. 
And I, I could go on, but uh, in the, because of time, Mr. Chairman, I will submit my uh, entire statement for the record. Uh, the, the gentleman, uh, with, uh, without objection, the gentleman's statement will be submitted to the record, and I'll submit my entire statement uh, for the record as well. Uh, the chair recognizes Senator Sanders from Vermont. Thank for, you very for, much. Uh, two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Kucinich, and, and Ranking Member Jordan. Thank you very much for the opportunity to say a few words. Um, what we're looking at uh, is a horrendous situation in two regards. Uh, most importantly, uh, men and women who have put their lives on the line uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, civilians working for private contractors who have been wounded, uh, came home with the expectation uh, that they would get the care and the benefits uh, that they were entitled to. And what we're seeing is time and time again, uh, large insurance companies like AIG are denying them the benefits that we have paid for as taxpayers. Uh, that's issue number one. Uh, issue number two is that at a time when this country has record-breaking deficits and an $11 trillion national debt, it is our obligation to make sure the taxpayers' money is well spent. And I think any serious investigation of uh, how money for workers' compensation in terms of these private defense contractors has been spent will indicate that there has been huge wartime profiteering. And that is an abuse of taxpayers' money that is not acceptable. Uh, clearly, under the last administration, there was virtually no oversight uh, in terms of the Department of Defense and the Department of Labor. So I think the time is long overdue for us to take a very hard look at the Defense Base Act, uh, make sure that all of those men and women who are hurting today get the care that they need, and we've got to make sure that we are not continuing to waste uh, billions of dollars of taxpayer money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Senator uh, Sanders. Uh, we're now going to uh, go to our witness, uh, since there are no f further comments uh, from members. Uh, I want to start by introducing the first panel. Uh, Seth Harris was sworn in as Deputy Secretary of Labor on May 26, 2009. Uh, you have an extensive uh, background, which we'll submit for the record, but in the interest of uh, expediting this hearing, we're going to go to your testimony. It is a policy, uh, Mr. Harris, of the Committee on Government Oversight and, uh, and, and Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I ask that you would please rise and that you would raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witness answered <clears throat> in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Harris, uh, we're going to uh, ask you to uh, all, all witnesses were invited to give a fi five-minute statement. I think that's a good idea that we try to stick to that. So would you proceed with a five-minute statement? In any event, your entire statement will be included in the record. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, and then we're going to immediately go to questions of you from the members, and then after that, we'll go to the next panel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Congressman Jordan, uh, Senator Sanders, and the other members of the subcommittee, Congressman uh, Cummings. Um, as the chairman said, my name pull is that, Excuse me, sir. Will you pull that mic a little bit I'm closer? Because there's a pretty high uh, reverb in this room. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Labor, and as the Labor Department's Chief Operating Officer, I oversee the Office of Workers' Compensation Programs Administration of the Defense Base Act. I'm grateful th for this opportunity to discuss the Department's role and responsibilities under the DBA and the values we bring to the discussion of how we might reform this important program. Let me begin by thanking uh, Chairman Kucinich, uh, the other members of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee who played a leadership role on this issue, and Senator Sanders. Uh, you've raised important issues about the operation of the DBA program and put the program on the path toward reform. Through your efforts and the diligent work of your staff, the issues are being explored and the program's problems are being brought to light. The Defense Base Act needs significant reform. The Department of Labor looks forward to working with you and other agencies of government to diagnose honestly the problems in the program and to craft the right solutions to those problems. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize and express my respect for the civilian contractors who will uh, address you this evening and in the process represent thousands of others who were injured or killed while giving support to our armed services and civilian agencies. The workers' compensation program they relied on to care for them in their time of greatest need did not work as well as it should have, and they deserved better. Now we must build a better system for them and for future claimants. 
Mr. Chairman, the Department's goal is to reduce the consequences of work-related injuries. Civilian contractors who work overseas in support of our military and civilian agencies should receive prompt and appropriate benefits to remedy the physical, psychological, and financial effects of injuries that happen in the course of their employment. Employees should know what benefits they may be entitled to and how to get them. Employers and their insurance carriers should have systems in place to respond to injury claims and voluntarily provide necessary medical benefits and monetary compensation for disability or death as quickly as possible. I look forward to working with you to assure to build a defense base act system that serves those values better than the system we have today. The Department of Labor recognizes that the DBA under the extreme and evolving conditions in which it's now applied is insufficient to meet the needs of its major participants. Written in 1941, the DBA was designed to protect a small cadre of, of American workers primarily engaged in engineering and construction work in Europe and the Pacific. Now the program serves an enormous international workforce engaged in nearly every imaginable type of occupation. They are employed by both American and foreign companies large and small. There are multiple layers of subcontracting, and to further complicate matters, contractors serve in distant countries with major language, cultural, and infrastructure challenges. In many cases, they serve in war zones and face the persistent threat of grievous injury from new types of insidious attacks, sometimes with limited medical care availability and the added challenges of evacuation. The Department of Labor knows about these difficulties, but we are trying to meet a complex 21st century challenge with a program from World War II. It simply isn't up to the task, and fundamental reform is needed. The Department has made every effort to implement the DBA fairly and effectively. However, it is my sense that even with additional resources, more modern technology, and redoubled effort by all concerned, the Department's effort would be insufficient to overcome the systemic challenges now facing the DBA. And we've already begun evaluating alternative approaches with the contracting agencies. The present structure of the DBA insurance program is characterized by severely limited competition in the insurance market, varying premium rates, procurement of insurance through widely divergent processes, and significant limitations on the ability to track and account for the contractors, subcontractors, and contract workers involved. These systemic problems raise serious questions about a whole range of issues, and I've got a long list of questions, Mr. Chairman, which we can come back to if you'd like in questioning, but I don't want to go over my time. The list of problems with the existing DBA program, along with others I'm, I'm, I, that are not on my list, is extensive and troublesome. However, the list of options to address these issues provides various paths to change and, we believe, improvement in the DBA program. We see four basic options with flexibilities within each. First, Congress could decide to leave the basic structure as is but revise specific sections of the laws to clarify, strengthen, and reform identified weaknesses and define what is not clear. Second, Congress may decide to replace the existing system with an option for the contracting agencies to self-insure their contracts instead of procuring private insurance or to remain in the private insurance system that currently exists. Third, Congress may decide that the entire federal program should be self-insured under one entity with no option for private insurance. And fourth, Congress may decide to simply leave the DBA statute as is, but provide additional resources to strengthen the oversight, regulation, enforcement, and reporting processes. The most important step the Labor Department can now take is to work closely with this subcommittee and the contracting agencies to analyze these options and determine which will best serve the civilian contractor workforce, and we're committed to taking that step. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to your questions and those of the members of the panel. Uh, I, th I, I thank the gentleman. We're going to now move to questions from members. Uh, I would just uh, ask uh, the witness and all other witnesses who would come in other panels uh, that when you're asked questions uh, by members, please uh, answer the question directly and be as succinct as you can in the interest of trying to get as much of the information that you have available to members of this committee. I'd like to begin by uh, talking about uh, the Office of Workers' Compensation. I understand this office has been underfunded for the past eight years, but does the Department of Labor really maintain records showing insurance uh, coverage with such advanced technology as this 3 by 5 card? Is it, is this, it says here this form was last updated in 1976. Is this, your, is this the way you keep records there? 
That's yes, Mr. Chairman. And you're right that that uh, that uh, card dates from the Ford is administration. It, is it time um, to upgrade the system? Um, it is time to upgrade that system, and we are going to fix that. We have a plan that we're ready to implement, and we're going to fix that system. That is the card on which we receive information uh, from the con from the uh, insurers about who they have covered, and we have a long stack of those cards, and that we use to w get this would information. Would you agree that if you have a lot of claims, wouldn't it be uh, uh, important to uh, the claimants to be able to uh, have uh, their data entered into a reliable and uh, sophisticated data collection system. I, I think that is right, but let me say that card isn't for claimant data. That card is for uh, the employers and the address. Insurers, right, insurers coverage of employers. That's right. Okay. Well, so you're saying you're committing that you're going to uh, work We're to We're going to fix it. Absolutely, yes. Now, I, I want to ask you also the um, your staff has made some disconcerting statements about the Department of Labor's authority to enforce DBA requirements. One staff member referred to the Department of Labor in these terms, said that uh, you're at best a scorekeeper, not really a referee. We know the difference between a scorekeeper and a referee. <laughs> Another staffer said that Congress intended the, uh, def uh, the uh, DBA program to be self-executing, where DOL only sits back and watches and jumps in when something goes bad. Do these comments represent accurately the current administration's view about its responsibility for DBA workers' compensation insurance? No. Will you change uh, DOL's policy and culture so that the Department of Labor exercises more authority? Well, the, the statute defines the scope of our authority, and the descriptions that, that you just repeated from, from members of my staff, and I'd be curious to know who they are, by the way. Um, I don't think actu accurately capture what our statutory role is. Uh, we are our, our principal. But you do have, I mean, the Department of Labor has a poor record of overseeing uh, DBA insurance. That's a legacy you do not want to repeat, I take it. Uh, well, I, I don't want us to do a poor job. That's certainly true, Mr. Chairman. Are you going to ensure this subcommittee that you're going to conduct a uh, top to bottom review of the Department of Labor's role in administering? the DBA insurance? Well, I think the most productive thing we can do, Mr. Chairman, is to work with you to fundamentally change the program. I think that there are a lot of administrative reforms we could make and we should do those. But, but let me say, the program is uh, not designed for the circumstances that we're in right now. Um, and what we need is fundamental reform. I think more resources, better technology, better systems might improve the circumstances somewhat. But let me say, for the, the folks who are going to be testifying on your next panel, I'm not sure any of those processes would have changed the outcome in their particular cases. Um, it's the system that we have, that, you know, a, a system that is, depends upon private insurance, that is an adversarial system like many workers' compensation systems, unfortunately, and a system that uh, results too often in adjudication that takes months and months and months and months. Um, but but it is true. It is true. If, if you're working with... Uh with old technology, that can slow down claims. And if you have insurance companies that don't want to pay the claims and a technology that slows down the claims, uh, you're going to have a frustration in the first case of people not getting their case in, uh, in front quickly enough, and in the second case of just the insurers not wanting to pay. That's the concern that we have. Well, I, sh I share the concern that the technological problems or the, or the systems that we're currently using result in some delay. But let me say, I don't think that's where the bulk of the delay in the system comes in. It's when a, you end up in an adversarial relationship between the insurer and the claimant. Let me talk about that, if I may, because I, I my time's running out to ask you questions. Uh, what, what are the limitations in the defense, uh, in, in the DBA, that prevent the Department of Labor from playing an active watchdog uh, role. The Act specifically states that the De Department of Labor may, quote, provide persons covered by this Act with legal assistance in processing a claim. On DLO, uh, D DOL's website, it states, the Department of Labor administers the Defense-Based Act, ensuring that workers' compensation benefits are provided for covered employ employees promptly and correctly. Please, uh, if you could respond briefly. Yeah, I, the, the role of the Labor Department is to process these claims and to uh, mediate, the, when there are disputes, to mediate disputes between the insurer and the claimant and to cajole, to pressure, to uh, beg, to beat about the head and neck the, uh, the insurers who are denying claims and to get to settlement as quickly as possible. We are not, however, 
an arbitrator or a judge. There is an adjudicative process that follows, and when the, when the Office of Workers' Compensation Programs advocates on behalf of a claimant and the insurer still refuses to pay, we end up, in, we end up with a referral into adjudication. And that's where I think the delays come in. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes uh, the you, minority leader, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Uh, chairman. Mr. Harris, uh, you, you've been, did I, did I get that right in, in the chairman's intro? Uh, you've been on the job three weeks. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Did, did I get that right when the chairman introduced you that you've been on the job three weeks? It seems a lot longer, but okay. yes, it's been about three weeks. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, I, 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 some of the line of your question, I think, was, was right on target. This is the second hearing I think we've had in six weeks, which dealt with a program at the Department of Labor where we've, uh, nothing against Mr. Harris, but, you know, he's been on the job three weeks. I think six weeks ago when we had the hearing on the H-2B program, we had no one from the Department of Labor here to talk about what was going on there and the lack of oversight that they had there. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is serious. Mr. Uh, Mr. Harris, in your, in your testimony, you talked about four, I think you said four approaches that would, would help, uh, help improve this, uh, this entire operation. And I just jotted them down because I didn't have your testimony right directly in front of me. You said one was to kind of define, clarify, refine how the current system works. I think the other one you said was to allow employers to self-insure. Third option was to have the entire system in some kind of self-insurance. And then the fourth one was more dollars, uh, more resources, I think was, was your term. Walk me through those real quickly. And which, which do you advocate? Which do you think makes the most sense? Um, Give me your thoughts on that. Uh, I, I, I thank you for that question. Let me just, if I could, modify your description of the second option a little bit. It's, it would be the contracting agencies that would self-insure or give okay. the, have the option of self-insuring rather than employers. There is some self-insurance by employers here that are not uh, insured. Okay. Um, each of these options um, uh, serves different purposes and accomplishes different results. So the question is, what, what problems are we most interested in trying to solve? If the principal problem that we're trying to solve is that this is an insurance market that doesn't have enough participants, self-insurance might very well be the, a uniform self-insurance system might well be the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we need to engage with the contracting agencies. The Department of Defense is going to come forward with a report in July. We need to engage with them to try and winnow down these four. But I think that what we're trying to suggest to the committee is that these are four options with variations uh, within each of them that I think that the committee should be thinking about as it considers which legislation. One, but but the, the, the question, I guess, is which one do you advocate? We're not advocating for any of the four just yet. We need to engage the contracting agencies before we're prepared to do and, that. And, and the study you said is going to be, the study is coming back when next my, month? My understanding is that the, the Defense Department is going to be reporting on July 13th about this program and okay. about the, the scope of well, uh, contracting. And we'll, look, we'll look forward to, uh, to that study. Um, when the United States first went into um, Iraq and Afghanistan, Many of the defense contract, uh, contractors, especially subcontractors, were unaware of the requirement to get the DBA insurance. What is the department doing now to make sure they are aware of that requirement? We're working with the contracting agencies. We're, uh, to, well, well, let me just say, the Defense Department, State Department, and USAID are right now working on trying to develop a comprehensive database of contractors. One of the problems that we've had is that we don't know who all the contractors, subcontractors, and sub-subcontractors are, and all of them are supposed to be insured. So we're working with them and trying to develop that database, but we're also mm -hmm working with them to try and get information out to the contractors and subcontractors. That is a very, very difficult task because often you have foreign subcontractors working for American right. contracting companies. It's just, it, 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 frankly, that has been one of the biggest challenges. There are contractors in this system that are not insured. But I assume there's some kind of formal education process that takes place on the front end from, how does it work? Uh, that's a fair question. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give you an answer to that. I don't know. I'll be able to get you more information about that, but I can't describe the, the, the way in which we educate contractors as they enter the system. Okay. Uh, but I'm happy to get you. We'll, we'll, my staff will get you some more information about that. Let me do an, a related question then here I have. Uh, DynCorp created what they refer to as uh, Civilian Police Employee Assistance Program, um, which informs employees about preparations they need to make prior to going to Iraq, Afghanistan. And then the, in the event of injury, SEEP um, officials act as an intermediary between the insurance company and the employee. Is this a good idea, this kind of approach? Do you think it's a good idea? Uh, where the employer provides an intermediary right. with the in insurer, um, I don't know. I don't know how, I'm not familiar with that program, so I don't know how well it works. Uh, I think anything that gets insurers to respond more quickly 
um, and gets those benefits paid and the medical benefits, the compensation okay. and the medical benefits paid more quickly is a good idea. But let me just say, um, I think that sort of tinkering around the edges is not going to work here. I think that we need to really look at fundamentally changing okay. this program because the, the, the system is it, it certainly not geared for the number of contractors that we have right now. In, you know, it, when, when this program was created, we were talking in the numbers of hundreds. Now we're talking in the thousands, 15,000, I believe, in the last fiscal year. That's, that's a lot of claims for a system that's not built for that, for, uh, to manage that, that quantity of claims. So I, you know, individual programs here and there may benefit, but as I said before, I think we need to look at fundamental reform. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Yes, Mr. Harris, uh, let me ask you this. Um, this is, uh, you said there was limited competition. I mean, in other words, there were limited numbers of insurance companies doing this? That's true. My understanding is that the three large insurance companies have about 90 percent of this market, AIG, CNA, and ACE. And um, I, I believe that AIG has 80 percent of the defense market. That's, that's not very much competition. And, and I believe the State Department has a sole source relationship with CNA. I, I may be... Okay. I'm All right. Let me tell you where I'm so, going. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me guide you to where I want you to go. Sure. Um, you can't, they can't lose with this, can they, with these contracts? They cannot lose. As I understand it, the way these, this DBA is structured, they cannot lose. In other words, the insurance company can't lose. Am I right? That because they're going to get paid the premium. They're going to get paid the big time. Hello? Am I right? I think that's right. Then why is there limited competition? I don't understand. It, we've got a profit. I mean, folks, corporations usually operate based on profit. You're telling me there are three companies. They cannot lose. So why is there limits? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not knocking you. I'm just curious. Yeah, I, that, I think that's an excellent question, and I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer it. I would say one, we were actually talking about this earlier today in preparation for the hearing. Uh, one, I think one part of it is that uh, the barriers to entry into the market are pretty high. For example, uh, AIG has a very extensive system of offices and uh, Arabic-speaking folks in, in Kuwait and, and I believe in Iraq. Um, and in order to get started up in this market and to be able to compete in the market, I think it would cost a lot of money to get in. That may well be it, but I, I don't want to represent myself as an insurance market I understand. expert. But you're going to have to do that. You're going to, be, you're going to have to become an expert because you're sitting here telling us that you believe that reform is necessary. And I do appreciate you saying that. Thank you for coming in here and not trying to snow us. Um, and, and, but this is the key. If we are going to change the system. We need to change it soon because in a few minutes some people are going to come up here and they're going to talk about their per personal tragedies. The one thing that, I, uh, that uh, Chairman Kucinich will tell you is that one of the things that we try to do is get government to work for people. And so if commitments, a commitment made is a commitment that has to be kept. And it's part of our responsibility when you come in here and tell us that something is wrong and needs to be corrected, and then after you testify, people who are victims of the system come up and tell us how they've been victimized, then if it's not changed, then we become a part of the conspiracy of failure and mediocrity. So now the question becomes, what's the timetable on all these changes that you're talking about? You've been kind enough to come in here and tell us that, every, that things are wrong, but that doesn't make that doesn't put one dime words don't put one dime in the pockets of these people whose families have suffered who they have suffered and who loved ones surviving loved ones are suffering so can you give us some timetables so we don't we're not doing the same thing next year this time well let me say i i agree with everything you just said thank you and i hope that uh, we're not here next year talk i'm i hear i hope we're here next year talking about how to implement a new program um, the urgency of now. Yeah, I agree with you completely. But let me also say the timing is up to you. Uh, Congress needs to reform this program. The Labor Department can't do it. There are changes that we can make, but the fundamental reform that's needed is up to you. Good. So what, tell me what do you think would be the most, you're, you're the one who's in the department, what do you think would be mo the most effective way for us to address what you have already seen in the department? And will we have the support 
if we do what you suggest of this administration. After all, the President is going to probably have to sign whatever we do. Uh, I, I don't want to represent that the President is going to sign whatever you do, but uh, we need to have more discussion <clears throat> with the contracting agencies. We're dedicated to doing that quickly. We're going to get this report from the Defense Department next month. Congress dictated that they do it, and they're doing it. Um, and then we're going to hopefully come to you with a proposal. I've tried to give you four ideas that you can begin working on immediately and try to assess how they match up with solving the problems that exist in this program. So I think we should get started with that discussion right away about how to get to a bill. Um, um, but I must say, because we need to have some more discussion within the administration about which of these choices we want you to make, uh, I want you to go ahead and get started, and we're going to come to you hopefully with an answer soon. But I, I, I can't tell you exactly when that's going to happen. Hopefully do, soon. do you think this profit margin of 40 percent is reasonable, or do you think that's a bit high? Uh, you know, Congressman, I'm not an insurance regulator, so I'm not really in a position to say. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes uh, Senator Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, As I, could, as I understand it, and you tell me if I'm wrong, uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the uh, business that KBR let out for insurance seemed to go to AIG. Does that sound right to you? I don't know about the, I don't know the specifics of KBR's business. I was speaking with Congressman Cummings about the market as a whole and the Defense Department market, but I, I can't that speak That is my to understanding. The overwhelming okay. amount of business from KBR went to AIG. And picking up on Mr. Cummings' point, uh, above and beyond the terrible treatment that people who put their lives on the line to defend this country have received, it does seem to me at least a little bit strange that uh, workers' compensation companies providing insurance in Iraq and Afghanistan have made underwriting profits of $600 million on $1.5 billion in premiums. I don't think you have to be an insurance expert to suggest that that may be war profiteering. Does that sound right to you? Um, I, I, it sounds like a lot of money to me. Um, again, I'm not, the Labor Department, again, just getting back to the Labor Department's role here, we're not insurance regulators. That's not our role in the system. Congress didn't give us that authority, so I'm, I'm just not in a position but to say. But your job, because we're playing with American taxpayers' dollars, that in this case goes from the taxpayers to the DOD, goes from the D, DOD to KBR, goes from KBR to AIG, what I think the taxpayers and the government of the United States expects is that when people, in fact, get hurt, they get justice. When they need medical help, when they need death benefits, their families need death benefits, they get it, and they get it in a prompt manner. Now, in my view, I don't want to be, get into a partisan sprawl here. I think the Bush administration will go down in history as one of the most incompetent administrations. And you guys are new on the job. But I hope very much, picking up from what Congressman Cummings just said, it is important that we turn the page on this issue. And it's important that you work with Congress to give us your ideas so that, A, we have a cost-effective program, we're not wasting billions of dollars, and number two, more importantly, that when people get hurt on the job representing the needs of the United States of America, they get prompt and just compensation. Does that sound fair enough? I agree with you, and let me, get, let me go a little further. You have my commitment that we're going to work with you to fix this program. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I thank uh, Senator Sanders, and the chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from California, Congresswoman Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very significant hearing. I want to thank uh, Mr. Harris for waiting all these uh, hours while we played in the sandbox on the floor, uh, because I think it's very, very important that we hear from you, the Department of Labor, because we had no idea uh, when this new administrative uh, group started that we would have the kind of unemployment. But a good friend of the people is now over there, Hilda Solis, and I know her staff will do an excellent job in trying to straighten this out. So according to data from the Labor Department and anecdotal evidence from federal contractors working overseas, the workers' compensation system currently in place is characterized by high denial rate, and you probably talked about this before uh, I came to the committee, but characterized by a high denial rate for those requesting compensation, while the insurance providers have benefited from significantly higher profits than those typically earned by conventional workers' compensation insurers. This uh, conflict 
is perpetuated by a seeming lack of comprehensive oversight of the system, and I hope that's something that we'll try to uh, iron out. With oversight duties fragmented between the Department of Labor, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Justice. So what kind of communication has there been? I think you've only been there on the job two weeks? About three and a half, minutes. About three and a half weeks. Picked up a lot. So what kind of communication has there been between the Department of Labor, the Department of Defense, to control the high premiums paid to insurance companies and to ensure federal contractors are receiving adequate care? We have been in discussion with the Defense Department about uh, reforming this program and the study that they are undertaking. Um, the, de the Labor Department has no authority over premiums in this system. That is determined by the contracting agency that, that uh, establishes the contracting relationship with the employer and establishes the relationship with the insurer. Um, so uh, we have no mechanism by which we can control those costs or, or, or regulate but those costs. as long costs. as you're talking to each other, I would hope that you would mention that this is a serious problem and that our committee has uh, questioned and to expect more questions from us. I, if you can pass that on. I will. And, uh, but uh, can you tell me why the Department of Labor only referred one case, and this is probably before you uh, arrived, one case to the Department of Justice for prosecution of an insurance carrier knowingly making a false statement for the purpose of reducing or denying benefits to an injured contractor despite evidence that such instances have occurred on numerous occasions. And if you have not been there long enough to know about this case, I wish you could get back to us and let us know what happened under the last administration to uh, reduce the number of cases that would go for prosecution. And with that, I'll yield back my time. I thank, I thank the gentlelady. I want to thank uh, Mr. Harris for his presence here. Uh, this committee uh, is uh, adamant about making sure that the Department of Labor reforms its uh, position on these matters to make sure that uh, those who were injured are able to receive the compensation that they uh, are entitled to. Uh, the committee thanks you and we will be uh, in touch with you. At this time, we're going to call uh, the second panel. We're combining the second and the third panel. I'd like everyone to come forward. And uh, while you're coming forward, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity. Uh, we'll we'll uh, just, just move expeditiously to make, put the witnesses in place. While you're coming forward, uh, I'm going to read some of the bios because we're going to keep moving this along. I also want to take the opportunity to thank those from the media who are here for their patience in waiting, uh, the reporters, the cameramen, the uh, technicians, and the producers. Uh, for your role in helping to communicate this uh, hearing to the general public. So thank you very much for, for uh, your uh, presence. Uh, while the panel's getting into place, I want to talk about uh, who we're going to be hearing from. Uh, Mr. Timothy Newman, Mr. Newman, welcome. He was a former uh, civilian contractor in Iraq for DynCorp. In 2004, he joined the U.S. Department of State a CIVPOL mission to Iraq as part of the global war on terror. He was 15 months in Greater Baghdad training the Iraqi police forces and protecting fellow mission officers until on September 2, 2005, he was severely injured by a roadside bomb. Uh, Mr. Newman lost his right leg and sustained several other major injuries. Upon returning home, he worked with DynCorp to develop a program to better care for injured contractors. Mr. Kevin Smith is a former civilian contractor who worked as a truck driver for KBR in Iraq. Uh, Mr. Smith was severely injured when his supply convoy was ambushed by insurgents outside Baghdad in 2004. John Woodson is also a former uh, truck driver for KBR in Iraq. Prior to going to Iraq, he was a construction supervisor in Houston, Texas, Working with cranes in the rigging industry, he also worked aerospace, commercial, and petrochemical fields uh, for 25 years. On October 28, 2004, John Woodson was hit by an IED, losing his leg and most of his eyesight. Gary 
v. Pitts. As an attorney who's been handling U.S. Department of Labor cases for the last 30 years, since the war began six years ago, he'd been representing more civilian contractors wound, uh, wounded, injured, or ill from the war zone than any other attorney in the country. He's had over 300 ongoing Defense Base Act cases at all times for the last uh, four years from all parts of our country. He's the owner of Pitts and Mills, Houston, Texas, served in the Army National Guard for 12 years and was a captain. General George Fay is Executive Vice President Worldwide PNC Claim of CNA. He's responsible for claim strategies and operations for CNA's property and casualty operations worldwide. He's also a member of CNA's operating committee. Before joining CNA in July 2006, General Fay was Executive Vice President and Chief Services Officer at the Chubb Corporation, where he spent more than 30 years in claims, operations, and administration, holding positions of increasing responsibility. He is also a retired Major General from the uh, U.S. Army Reserve. Christian P. Moore is AIG's Executive Vice President and President of AU, uh, AIU Holdings, Incorporated. He's responsible for worldwide general insurance companies of AIU Holdings, Inc., a leading global property and casualty holding company. He's also an Executive Vice President of American International Group, Inc. Prior to the formation of AIU Holdings, Inc., Mr. Moore was President and Chief Executive Officer of AIG's Property Casualty Group. Finally, Charles R. Schrader, uh, and he is going to be joining uh, Mr. Moore for questions from members. Uh, is that correct? You won't be making an opening statement, is that right? Uh, he is president of Worldwide Claims American International Group. As president of AIG's Worldwide Claims Operation, Mr. Schrader has uh, substantial experience in addressing claims under the Defense Base Act and War Hazards Compensation Act. I would like uh, all of the witnesses who are either going to be uh, making a statement answering or answering questions or both, I would ask that you um, rise because it's the policy of our committee on oversight and government reform to swear all witnesses in before they testify. Uh, I would ask that, um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Woodson. I would ask that uh, each of you um, uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Uh, as with panel one, I ask that each witness give an oral summary of uh, his testimony. And to keep this summary under five minutes in duration, your entire testimony will be included in the record of this hearing. Uh, and I would like to, I'd like to begin with Mr. Newman. Uh, thank you uh, very much for being here, and, uh, uh, and, and to those who, who, who are here as contractors and have served, I, I think it is appropriate on behalf of the subcommittee to also say thank you for serving the United States of America. Uh, you may continue. Thank you. Uh, my name is Timothy Newman, and I was injured in Iraq in, uh, in 2005 while working for DynCorp as a civilian contractor. Since my injury, I've personally endured the effects of an outdated Defense Base Act and also advocated for other injured contractors through the ordeals. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. I joined the Marine Corps at 17 and became a South Carolina police officer at 22. After September 11th, I volunteered for the civilian policing mission through DynCorps International with the U.S. State Department. I landed in Iraq on the 4th of July, 2004 and hit the ground running literally. I served with the uh, State Department training unit that worked to train the existing Iraqi forces. We traveled the Biop Highway several times per day, and my, uh, my unit actually moved over 3,000 passengers without any injuries until September 2nd of 2005. Just after leaving our compound, my vehicle was hit by a roadside bomb. The blast completely blew through the driver's section of my vehicle. My navigator and friend of 20 years, Leon Vince Kimbrell, was killed instantly. The shrapnel and the blast tore off my right leg, shattered my left leg, almost severed my left wrist, and sent shrapnel through my lung, intestines, and chest. I was blown completely out of the vehicle and found myself with a useless body on a dirty Baghdad street. I dragged myself down the street until my team rescued me and delivered me to the combat surgical hospital in the international zone within 20 minutes of the attack. I spent the next 22 days in a medically induced coma and woke up in the U.S. military hospital in Longstuhl, Germany. 
This is where my personal story with the DBA begins. My initial care was amazing and my treatment by CNA was good. I was appointed a local case manager who ex expedited my care and worked with the hospital. My care did not begin to fail until I left the hospital. In February of 2006, I was ready to start walking on a prosthetic leg. And by October, I was disillusioned with the absence and communication, lack of communication by my former employer, DynCorp. So I wrote a letter to the CEO. In a few weeks, I received a phone call inviting me to Texas to talk about my complaint. I went to Texas with a shiny new leg and met my former bosses, and the meeting end would, ended with a decision to start a program of employee care. I also left with a part-time job to start the new program. We made great headway in caring for our employees and started associations and programs to help them. We had far less success with our insurance carriers. The actions that we received from the insurance carriers and companies were simply lip service. Other than limited support for some of our programs, they did nothing to make the process easier on our side or theirs. It was typical double talk and empty promises. After two years of fighting, I left the program late last year. In 2007, my treating physician recommended I get a power knee system, a true bionic leg that acts in place and supplements the muscles that I lost. The legal battle for this leg took over a year and a half and resulted in me getting the system 557 days after it was initially requested. The administrative law judge that concluded the power knee was both reasonable and medically necessary found that CNA ex CNA's experts, quote, neither physicians have opined with any degree of certainty that the power knee prosthetic will not address the claimant's need and that both have little knowledge regarding the claimant's medical status and regular daily activities and have no firsthand knowledge of the power knee prosthetic. In October of 2008, one month after leaving DynCor, my biweekly compensation checks arrived, began arriving, but it were only half of what the amount should be. After weeks of no, no communication, CNA claimed that while I was employed by DynCorp, I was overpaid. So without warning or discussion, they cut my compensation to recoup their funds. Of course, their assumption of what I made was baseless, and at the time, they did not even have my pay records from DynCorp. I suffered through financial hardships for no real reason. My legal counsel requested a hearing on this dispute. It is now June, and our hearing is set for August, almost a full year after the problem started. In the three and a half years after, since my injury, I have met and tried to help so many people who were damaged in our national defense. I have personally talked three friends out of suicide, and each of them suffered greatly from post-traumatic stress disorder, but their biggest battle was the one they were having with their insurance carrier to get real care for their problems. I know of more than one friend that did take their own life. I have helped and supported a friend facing double amputation for war injuries while the carrier said it was not medically necessary. I have helped a man who had an RPG go straight through him twice who was denied help, support, or communication from their insurance carrier. I have seen friends with blast-related hearing loss be denied help and be forced to buy their own hearing aids while their cases went to court. I can continue on and on. I'm not an expert, but I'm a victim with common sense who has seen failures of our current system. In my experience, the single biggest cause of these failures the insurance, uh, is the insurance carrier's practice of seeking profit in every way possible from our fight for national survival instead of becoming part of the forces united against our enemies. When this act was written by Congress, they sought to provide an expedited workers' compensation system for war effort workers. Once the DBA carriers hijacked the system and saw it as a source of profit, the program was lost. I would like to personally thank you for your interest in this issue and your commitment to the making a difference and your service to all of us, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Mr. Smith, you may proceed. And I would ask that you hold the mic close enough so we can hear your testimony. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, ladies of the committee, I, I appreciate you all having me here today. This has been a long time coming and I'm, I'm proud to be here. Uh, my experience with AIG has been traumatic at best. I thought everything was fine at first, and then, as I needed more treatment, things be began to get tougher. I couldn't get treatments my doctor recommended, like medication and sleep studies, so I did without or I paid them uh, for myself, which has greatly hindered my continuity care, and thereby increasing the time it has taken me to achieve the goals dictated by my medical providers. And the trauma associated with PTSD is nothing, I mean, nothing compared to the trauma myself and my family has had to cope with because of AIG's blatant incompetence and egregious behavior. In two separate instances, AIG has stopped paying my indemnity. The first time was in November of 05, and then again in November of 07. 
In November 05, the benefits were reinstated, but it took several months before I started receiving my checks again. Then I had to fight to get the checks I had missed. I started investigating and was alarmed to find out that my doctor had not been pay paid for procedures or office visits from 04. Although AIG would approve the treatment, they would not pay. So the doctor that saved my leg and possibly my life was considering not treating me any longer. In November of 07, AIG completely stopped paying all benefits, including medical that I'm supposed to receive for life, according to the DBA. They refused to pay for another surgery needed on my knee or any other doctor's care. They would not even pay for medication I was taking for the PTSD. Basically, they completely ignored the fact that I had been diagnosed with PTSD as a result of my experience in Iraq, and they have used some of the most ridiculous excuses trying to defend their position. And to top it all off, they tried to say they had overpaid me by $23,406.60. I had to endure a long, grueling battle to reinstate the benefits that I should that should have never been stopped. During this time, my family and I still had to live, so I was forced to return to a work in a job that exacerbated my uh, injuries to my leg and the PTSD. They stopped, stopped benefits based solely on the fact that the schedule on my leg was paid out without considering I was still being seen by a psychologist, which I might add, they approved. They obviously knew they had no legal grounds to drop me, but I guess that's part of the game they play in order to wear people down so they will no longer have the will to fight. My attorney put in a request for an informal hearing with the DOL, the Department of Labor, which was denied. We appealed that and got our hearing in which the hearing officer found in favor of me in order that the benefits being reinstated. But in AIG's normal fashion, they acted with impunity and continued to deny benefits. We then requested a formal hearing with an administrative law judge and were heard on 30th of July of 07. Judge C. Richard Avery found that I should in fact receive all benefits and back pay with interest plus all out-of-pocket expenses and all, that, all the doctors be paid. AIG has still failed to comply with this order entirely. They have not called and approved my treatment for PTSD. They have denied payment for medications. They have just now made a partial payment to my doctor for services rendered back in 04. And I want to point out the partial payments, ladies and gentlemen. They only paid less than half in most cases and never, I repeat, never have they paid in full. In summary, I have provided this committee with facts that I've backed up with evidence of AIG's downright criminal handling of cases of American men and women who put their lives in peril for this great country. All personnel serving in a hostile foreign land must be taken care of when they return home, whether they served in the military or as a civilian contractor, because we did what most people would not do. Therefore, we should all be considered by our country as the heroes we are. A large portion of the contractors, like myself, were veterans of numerous hostile engagements and volunteered to go to Iraq for the chance to once again serve their country. And we demand that we receive the care that was promised us and we deserve. Listen, we're not asking for millions of dollars of bonuses. We're not asking for lavish parties or even parades. We want what we are entitled to under the Defense Base Act, like medical care, disability pay, and retraining if necessary. Thank you. I thank Mr. Smith. Uh, chair recognized Mr. Uh, Woodson uh, for five minutes, and I just ask you to make sure that mic is close to you so we can hear your testimony. And my two colleagues here have covered quite a bit here and said a lot. Uh, I, would, I would ask staff to assist Mr. Woodson and bring that uh, uh, microphone close enough. Is that close enough? Uh, we can test it and make sure it's on. Is that close enough? Oh, that's that, Mr. Woodson. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, bear with me here, please. Just you take your time. Go ahead. And thank you all for having me here, having all of us here. I would like to thank each and every one of you as much for inviting us today to share my experiences with you. And, and my name is John Woodson. Prior to going to Iraq, I was a construction supervisor in Houston, Texas working with cranes and rigging in the rigging industry. I worked aerospace, commercial, and petrochemical f 
fields, investing 25 years of my life. In late 2003, KBR representatives contacted me asking if I had a thought about going to Iraq and help rebuild the country, which to me that was a great opportunity to provide my uh, contribution to this country. So I left in June of 2004 to go to Iraq. And unfortunately, I was blown up by an IED blast on October 28th, 04. Now here we are in June 2009, five years later, and I am still wondering why events have happened the way they have. After waking up from a uh, medically induced coma at the Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas, I was sent to a rehabilitation facility called TIER. There I was visited by a James Heil from ASG. He was a representative adjuster and investigator working for AIG Insurance. After seeing my condition, he stated that there, there wouldn't be any problem because AIG was going to take care of my life and everything involved, a statement that will shortly turn out to be untrue because the first problem quickly arose. The first problem was m my money. Nothing was being deposited in, into my account. My wife, brother, and daughter then spoke with uh, Mr. Hall about the issue. He told them that uh, the situation would be looked into. Several weeks later, I did receive a deposit, but the, the weekly average was lower than what had been spoken about. At that point, I called AIG Insurance and spoke to Jim McIntyre, who refused to talk to me. He flatly said to me, hire an attorney, and AIG would discuss the uh, issue with them. At first, I wanted to believe that it was just a small misunderstanding because it, it was a, a new account, but the uh, reality soon sank in and the result would be larger than I could even imagine. The conflict that started then is still going on today. Every aspect is a disagreement, a complex and infinite process from medical, money, pharmaceuticals, transportation. Even the Department of Labor in Houston has not been any help, and I am just naming a few of the list on the list, and it is too, really too long to write. Ladies and gentlemen, due to my vision impairment, speaking about this matter would be much easier on me, it'd be much more conducive, and as of, of April 24, 2009, my case has been turned over to the U.S. government and I still haven't noticed much of an improvement. In conclusion, I asked why. Where has the oversight been, and who is in charge of this operation? Mr. Whitson, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Pitts. Thank you, uh, Chairman Kucinich and Ranking Member Jordan, Congresswoman Watson, and Congressman Cummings. Thank you for starting this process. I thank you for your interest and attention to uh, these brave men and women that go over there and fill in for what the Army used to do. Okay. I've had the opportunity, the privilege of representing hundreds of them, and based on that experience and on 30 years of operating before the Department of Labor, um, here are my five recommendations to make this system work uh, more quickly and better. First of all, uh, there hasn't been any additional funding since the war began for the Office of Workers' Compensation Programs and the Office of Administrative Law Judges. Whereas AIG, for example, had three adjusters in 2004 in Dallas that handle these cases, now we have about 30, a tenfold increase. So there's been no increase 
at the Department of Labor. There are some, uh, for example, um, the OALJ could use some video conferencing equipment. That sounds pretty mundane, but that could help a lot. Maybe cost $200,000 to outfit all of them with video conferencing equipment. Right now, we have to do a circuit. We're like the Old West. We go to the claimant, uh, the judge does, I go, and the defense attorney. Um, if we had video conferencing equipment outfitted with the judges, we could have those conferences done more quickly. We could move this process along. It'd, be, it'd save money from having to send the judge there and back and save his time. Second thing I would suggest is on PTSD, it is taking about a year, a year and a half to work through the system before somebody can get treatment. Uh, the contractors don't, the Army in contrast, uh, they tell people what the symptoms are before they leave the theater, they check back up on them two or three months later. Contractors don't have any of that. They get back, they start having symptoms, their family sends them uh, to get some help. Um, they enter the process of litigating their case. This is a wasteful system like it is because the litigation costs are eventually going to get put off on the taxpayer. I'm trying to work my, out of myself out of some work here. All these people should immediately be able to go to the VA. They're coming out of the war zone. They should just go to the VA. The VA is set up for taking care of PTSD. Just let them go there. Get in line with everybody else with the group therapy. There's less chance of them hurting themselves, hurting people around them. And that's economical. It's efficient. And it's an exception. There'll be some people that say, well, they're not in the military. They shouldn't be able to go to the VA. This is an exception. They're right there next to our soldiers. Uh, the enemy doesn't distinguish them from our soldiers. If they've got PTSD uniquely situated from coming from the war zone, just let them go to the VA. Third thing is there is presently no requirement that if one of these men is killed over there, uh, that the widow acknowledge that there's such a thing as death benefits. There's a possibility of death benefits under the act. Um, our surviving spouse. There are also ladies over there. Um, that could be easily remedied. Just basically, the employer would have the obligation to get a one-page acknowledgement from the widow saying, I understand there's the possibility that I may be able to enti be entitled to death benefits under the Defense Space Act. And they ought to be able to attach that to their paperwork in order to get paid, or they don't get paid by the government, or they don't get a new contract. There's some, this should be able to be enforced quickly so we don't have the anomaly of some lady in a small part of, of the, the country with a, a house full of children and their breadwitters dead, uh, going on government relief because she hasn't figured out what the Defense Space Act is and how to fill out the right form to file it with a New York office within a year, the statute of limitations. So that's a, a little gap that can be taken care of. The fourth thing I would suggest is there's now really no stick for the administrative law judge. And let me point out, make this clear, nobody can make the insurance company do anything except the judge. The Department of Labor has no power to make them do anything. They can give informal recommendations, which we have to have, in order to have the case come up to be assigned to one of the 40 or so administrative law judges that hear these cases. But we have to go through this process and litigate these issues in order to get resolution. Now, they'll do what the judge tells them to. They have to. Um, well, we have some problems sometimes. <laughs> even with that. However, the judge is really the only one that can make them do things. So the, if we can beef up the OALJ, they used to have like up 100 judges to do the black lung docket. They need some extra ones. You can see from my paper, the trials have gone from 95 in 2005 to about 578 scheduled this year. It's a five-fold increase. Uh, they need some help. They haven't been any additional funding. So <clears throat> anyway, what I'm suggesting is the judge needs a stick. At this point, all he can do is make them do what they should have done to begin with. Plus, they have to pay um, my time for having hold, held them down to make them do something, and they have to pay interest. But it's at short-term treasury rates. So these gentlemen, if they go through litigation and the judge says, like Judge Avery did in Mr. Smith's case, you've got to pay this, they also only have to pay like one half of 1%. That's the interest they have to pay. So the judge should be able to, would, if there's a gentleman a, uh, uh, wrap up his uh, I will. testimony. And he should be able to assess a 15% penalty for a frivolous, I mean a 10% penalty or whatever, for a frivolous defense. In addition, they can profit by the CFR, 20 CFR 61.104. They can add 15% handling fee for litigating uh, a War Hazards Act claim. So if they're hurt from enemy action, they can profit by litigating it. That needs to change. Thank you very much, Mr. Pitts. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, General Fay. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, thank please, you, uh, please, 
please speak, uh, draw that mic a little closer, please. Is that better, Mr. Chairman? Uh, a little bit closer. We want to hear your testimony. Thank you. Go okay, ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Ranking Member Jordan and the distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of CNA Insurance. I am George Fay, Executive Vice President of Worldwide Property and Claim for CNA Financial Corporation. I have more than 30 years of experience in the insurance industry. I retired from the United States Army Reserve as a Major General in May 2008 after 38 years of service, including almost four years on active duty in support of the global war on terrorism and Operation Iraqi Freedom. During those four years, I served in many parts of the world, including Iraq and Afghanistan, side by side with defense contractors in every location. I share the subcommittee's view that civilian workers in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere around the world are performing a crucial service for this country and that they deserve fair treatment in the administration of insurance claims. I understand well the sacrifices being made by the men and women who support our military operations abroad, and I am pleased to be part of the CNA family that takes great pride in supporting those that make such great sacrifices. CNA understands that this hearing focuses on two categories of concern under the Defense Base Act, claims handling and underwriting gains. With regard to claims handling, I would like to address uh, some errors that were made in the majority staff's June 16, 2009 memorandum addressed to the subcommittee. The memo implies that CNA has a record of unnecessarily pushing claims to administrative rulings. This is misleading. In fact, of the approximately 5,500 claims that have been filed, CNA believes that fewer than 20 of those claims, less than 0.4%, have gone to administrative rulings. Of those cases, CNA has lost only a handful. Even in the cases that CNA has lost, there was never a finding that CNA acted in bad faith or advocated frivolous positions. CNA's experience is consistent with the written statement of Seth Harris, who you just heard from before, as the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Labor, which noted that the DOL has found no deliberate intent to delay claims handling. His statement is borne out by the numbers I have set forth in my written statement. We are contacting insured workers and their companies within 24 hours, 86% of the time. And despite the strict, we believe too strict, requirement to make a compensation, uh, com compensability determination within 14 days. We have been able to make that determination within those 14 days 75% of the time. Related to the underwriting concern, it should be noted that the overall CNA DBA underwriting gain from 2008 to, 2000, to I'm sorry, from 2002 to 2008 was only 14%. Moreover, CNA's role in the at-large part of the business on which the subcommittee is focusing today has been minuscule since 2006, with only about 3% of the market share. In contrast, CNA is currently the only provider of the widely praised program contracts, which are awarded through a bidding process. In 2008, Chairman Waxman lauded this process and highlighted CNA's presence in the market. We concur with those who suggest that the program contracts are the solution to the DBA underwriting concerns. CNA would be happy to work with the subcommittee to improve the process governing DBA contracts. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to discuss these issues today and I, was, I would be pleased to answer any questions that the subcommittee has. I thank the gentleman, Mr. Moore. You may proceed. Please bring that microphone close so every member of the committee can hear your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. AIG is pleased to participate in this hearing examining Defense Base Act DBA insurance for federal contractors working overseas. Given the importance of this issue, 
AIG looks forward to working with the subcommittee on ways to improve the DBA program to ensure proper coverage for contractors. The DBA program is one of the many lines of coverage offered by AIG's general insurance. In order to provide the subcommittee with a better understanding of AIG's participation in the DBA program, I am joined today by Charles Shader, President of AIG's Worldwide Claims. Mr. Shader has 25 years of experience in insurance claims management, including the extensive experience with the DBA program. He has provided testimony for the record that outlines AIG's participation in the program and identifies several areas where we think the program can be improved. AIG has had a long and proud history of providing DBA coverage. While others, in, other insurers participate in the DBA program, no other insurer has created a center of excellence for the care of injured workers comparable to ours. AIG has also made significant investments in our claims management process to facilitate our participation in the DBA program. AIG now has claims professionals located in six global offices that are equipped to handle unique regional and local needs. As but one example, the Dubai office staff is fluent in four languages. It has developed expertise in overcoming geographic and cultural obstacles, paying benefits in country in local currencies, and conducting investigations in the Middle East to locate claimants while obtaining witness statements and verifying dependency. As Mr. Shader has identified in his written statement, AIG believes that there are three key areas where the DBA program can be improved through a combination of legislative and regulatory reform. First, providing detailed, accurate status reports to claimants instead of the LS-207 controversial notice. Second, rationalizing and simplifying the calculation of average weekly wage and interagency cooperation on the diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. We look forward to answering any questions the subcommittee may have. In particular, Mr. Shader will be able to speak in greater detail regarding the DBA practices. I thank the uh, gentleman for his testimony. General Fay, I, I was interested in your testimony. There seems to be a variance from your, uh, according to staff, there seems to be a variance from your uh, prepared testimony to what you presented to this committee in that you uh, quoted from a uh, internal committee document that hadn't uh, been uh, released and that was really the property of this committee. I just wondered, uh, where did you get your information from? I was given that by a member of our staff, sir, but I don't know where exactly Which, they returned. What was the name of the member of your staff that gave that to you? Uh, it was our uh, head of... Remember, you're under oath. Who, who gave it to you? Yes, uh, I got it from our head of, uh, of uh, legislative affairs. Is your head of legislative affairs here right now? Yes, she is. Who's that? Would they identify themselves? Would you like to come to the committee table? Uh, do you want to identify yourself? Uh, would you like to be sworn? Do you have an attorney here? Uh, no, I mean, we have several attorneys on staff. I'm not an Okay, would you, uh, would, you, uh, would you raise your right hand? Yes. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I, do. Uh, I was referencing an internal document uh, that had not yet been released that was quoted by uh, General Fay. Uh, he said that you gave him that information. Is that correct? Uh, to be completely honest, I was working with Mr. Watson here, who was with our parent company, and it could have not been either one of us. I beg Dave to Mr. Fay. Can you hear me now? 
I was working with our parent company of lobbyists, Lowe's Corporation, Mr. Watson. It was either he or I that gave it to him. Where, where did the document, he said, Mr. Faye said he got it from you. Where did you get it from? We were, I, I want to make sure I'm clear, we were doing a lot of visits on the Hill. I, Committee staff, uh, which committee staff? Democratic committee staff? We're going to, uh, this isn't, uh, uh, this is tangential to the purpose of this hearing, uh, but uh, uh, you are going to be uh, subject to further uh, questions uh, from our attorneys uh, where that document came from. It's really uh, somewhat unprecedented for information to uh, that has not yet uh, been released to the public to uh, uh, be in the hands of a witness who then uses it to, com to criticize the committee report. And this is something that uh, we're going to find out who gave you that. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll deal with it as an internal committee matter. Yes, Mr. Uh, Jordan. Well, Mr. Chairman, I've just checked with uh, the staff that is present here. They indicated that they did not uh, give that document out. We're, I certainly didn't. Don't know of anyone on our staff well, who did. And, well, you know, and I this just, is highly unusual, too, that we bring in people from the audience who haven't been cleared and we don't know are going to be witnesses. I, I didn't expect that uh, General Fay would be giving testimony uh, that would reference an internal report and then say that he himself did not know where that came from uh, but referred to someone else. That's why we did it. Now, we are, go we are not going to change the subject of this hearing. But I just want uh, you to know, General Fay, and I want the general lady to know and the people in the audience who are involved, that you are going to be subject to further questioning about this. Now, uh, thank you very much. You're dismissed. Uh, general Fay, uh, we've heard from these witnesses, from Mr. Newman, Mr. Smith, uh, and, uh, and Mr. Woodson, uh, all about their problems in getting um, um, paid by uh, various uh, people. Mr. Newman. Uh, is the one that had the experience uh, directly with CNA. Uh, is, it the, is it the policy of, um, well, let me put it this way. Would you provide for this committee your internal documents with respect to what your strategies are for denial to increase your corporate profits? We have no such documents that uh, have that kind of a strategy. Uh, I wouldn't be associated with a company that had such a strategy. So you're, so you're saying that you don't make money denying claims? That's not exactly what I said. I said. Do you uh, agree with that Mr. statement? Do you, does, does, it, does CNA make money denying claims? That is not what we're in the business to do. We're in the business to insure people for the risks that we are insuring, and when the uh, claims are legitimate claims. Uh, according to whatever the insurance policy is that we issue to them, then we pay them. We pay them promptly. We pay them according to the law. And we take great pride in doing well, that. We have testimony that contradicts that. What I'm going to do, my time has expired, but I want to uh, indicate we're going to have a second round, uh, and we're going to uh, come back to uh, General Fay and Mr. Moore about uh, the testimony that we're hearing about your claim uh, denials and whether or not you have a conscious strategy as a business to deny claims to people who have been injured uh, or killed in a war. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank the chairman. And let me, uh, let me just begin by thanking all our witnesses, and in particular um, those of you who have been serving our country in a war zone. We, we certainly appreciate your sacrifice. They can't hear you. Okay. Let, I, I just said I want I want to thank our, uh, thank our witnesses, in particular those who have been serving on the front lines. Uh, Mr. Pitt, uh, you talked about in your testimony mm -hmm. problems both with insurers and with um, the Department of Labor. And uh, you had some, I thought, some good practical recommendations in, um, in your testimony, um, notifying, putting families on notice that there would be a death benefit in the, in the event that that tragedy took place. Uh, I think in point number four, you talk about uh, frivolous claims and also uh, when actually insurance Actually, frivolous defenses. Pardon? Uh, frivolous. We've always heard about frivolous claims for 10 years, but this is a frivolous defense. You know what I mean? I understand. Position. Claim it brings a frivolous. But you also talk about bad behavior on the part of in insurers. Um, yes. Just, just as a general question, where is, where is the bigger problem? Is it, is it the lack of oversight, lack of 
is it the government or is it the insurer? No. I mean, you, you've, you've brought, I think it, you said, hundreds of cases. There are Where do you see a, the, real, the real concern? There's a defect in the law that needs to be changed. It wouldn't be difficult. Here's what it is. Under the present Code of Federal Regulations, and this is my fifth point, it's not in the, uh, uh, an insurance carrier, it's not necessarily these gentlemen, any insurance carrier uh, is in a position where, you know, amorally or whatever, it is in their interest to litigate a War Hazards Act case mm -hmm. because under 20 CFR 61.104, they get their litigation costs back. They get their attorney's fees back and they get to add 15%, okay? You can't get 15% in the CD now. You can't get 15% assured in the stock market. It's a great deal. So let's say a PTSD case, and this has happened where the claimant's, uh, claimant's doctor said he's got PTSD from the war zone. The insurance company doctor agreed he's got PTSD from the war zone. Nonetheless, the case was litigated all the way to completion, and there was a judicial finding, yes, this guy has PTSD from the war zone. Within six weeks, the War Hazards Act bureaucracy had picked it up and said, okay, now you're going to get all your money back. Mm -hmm. All that litigation costs that the defense had, they get to add 15 percent. Okay. So if it costs 20,000, they get to, they get how much, you know? So not only do they have the opportunity to defeat the claim, they drag it out. Who's suffering in this is the guy with PTSD or other kinds of injuries. So half of these cases, about half of these cases are because of enemy action. They're going to get probably picked up by the War Hazards Act eventually. So if that was modified um, to they get, you know, a handling fee of short-term interest rates, which is what these men get. Mm -hmm. They get about a half of 1%. So if that's what they got, you know, and it would fluctuate with times, that would be uh, more appropriate. But as it is, there is a built-in incentive for the carrier to profit from litigation. How, uh, how many cases do you say you had handled? 100, I think you said? I, well, I have about three, more than 300 going on at any one time over the last four years. How many of those cases are PTSD? About 20 percent, which is about the same ratio as the, the soldiers coming out of the war zone. My most frequent demographic, talk, demographic is a truck driver hit by a war side, oh, right. roadside bomb. Talk to me about, uh, you were critical uh, in your testimony of the Department of Labor. And, and as I said in my, in my first round with, with Mr. Harris, uh, you know, the second time we've had, uh, second hearing that's dealt with the Department of Labor, first time we've had someone from the Department of Labor come and testify, and the person they send has been on the job three weeks, you know, something this important you'd seem, you would think, they would send someone, nothing against Mr. Harris, but send someone who's been on the job a little longer, had a little more experience with the, with the critical program. So tell me about your, your concerns with how the Department of Labor has I failed both, to handle their responsibilities. I think both the Department of Labor, Office of Workers' Compensation Programs, which is only about, I don't know, 200, 250 people or so in the country that do this stuff, and the Office of Administrative Law Judges, which is about 40 judges and their staff, have done a great job with the resources they have. The system is not set up so that the OALJ, or rather the OWCP, gets to tell anybody anything. They can give recommendations. But if a carrier can litigate and profit off of it, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. They give the recommendations, they're ignored. We go into litigation, it takes about a year or so to get finally uh, a judicial decision to enforce. And during that time, they're hanging on to the money and you know they get the end of it. If it's a War Hazards Act claim, they get to uh, get some money, plus 15%, you know, the 15%. So I think that's been the problem. If you take that, if you take the, that profit motive out of it, that incentive psychologically, subconsciously, whatever, if you take that out of it and if mm -hmm. they can get hit for some penalty, 10%, 15% for a frivolous defense found by a judge, this was a frivolous defense. They had no defense, it's frivolous. If they can get hit by 10 or 15%, it hits their pocketbook, you know, I think that would be reasonable. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings from Maryland. You may proceed for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, as, as I sit here and I listen to all of this, it seems that we're talking at two different universes. We've got one with these gentlemen who have been harmed and who uh, continue to suffer, and then we've got the insurance companies uh, that sound as if they are operating the greatest operation in the world uh, and doing every single thing that they can for these gentlemen. and. It is a sharp contrast. Uh, to uh, Mr. Moore, according to a Los Angeles Times ProPublica story, AIG stopped paying uh, disability benefits to a civilian contractor whose leg was shattered by an insurgent ambush in Baghdad and who suffered from PTSD 
even though some, some of your own experts diagnosed him as partially disabled. Further, some four and a half years later, in 2008, an administrative law judge ruled that AIG had failed to offer medical evidence to support his position that the contractor's PTSD was not caused by the convoy attack. The article, which was published in April of this year, states that AIG has still not paid Mr. Smith's outstanding medical bills as ordered, uh, I suppose pending AIG's appeal. My question is this, on what basis is such a determination made, if not on the opinion of AIG's own medical experts, how is the legitimacy of a, a claim determined and how many claims has AIG denied in which your own expert has sided with the insured? Congressman Cummings, um, Mr. Uh, Shed would be much more qualified. Make sure you put his, put your, put, oh, yeah, we want to hear what he ha okay. has to say. Okay, sure. Nice and loud, please, sir. Pardon? I want to hear you. Oh. And these gentlemen want to hear you, too. Yes. You know, we do agree that there are many. The, the witness is directed to put the microphone closer so that everyone in this room I'm can sorry. hear you. I'm sorry. Is Thank that you. better? Yes. Um, we agree that there were many changes in this system that would help in its administration and provide a better product, faster, quicker compensation, clearer rules for um, those people who have been hurt overseas and as severely as these individuals have been. And, you know, I want to make it very clear on behalf of myself as well as my company that we really do owe them a debt and this is not, you know, anything vindictive or a corporate policy of denial or, you know, it, it's a question of administering programs under an act that is ill-suited and I have in my written statement submitted at least three fairly detailed uh, areas of reform that would help. and. I think increasing labor department oversight and administration would be of greater assistance, making it more like a state a workers' comp agency would help. Um, there are some claims and that are very, very complex here. And we have provided some files to the committee and it's hard almost to the point of impossibility in the few minutes we have to go through the steps of Mr. Uh, Smith's claim piece by piece to show why what we did was right under the benefit levels and the rules that we have to deal with. I, and I've offered to meet with the committee or the staff of the committee and bring in any member of my staff to go through those with you and I'd be more than happy to. And if it would aid in the reform of the system and how the benefit levels are calculated, I would be more than happy to do that. Let me ask you this. The, yeah. the aim of workman's compensation is basically no fault. Is that right? Mm -hmm. In other words, to expedite the a claimant's uh, a workers, uh, re uh, so, so that the worker can recover once they have an accident or a problem. Is that right? I absolutely agree with and that. And so basically what is happening here is that although the insurance is for the purpose of moving a claimant along so that they may be compensated quickly, so that the claimant doesn't have to end up having to file suit. That's what, that's what workman's compensation was all about. Uh, when I was in the state legislature, I was an expert on workman's comp. I know the federal may be a little bit different. And it seems as if, to me, as if you, AIG is doing just the very opposite of what workman's compensation was, was supposed to do. It was supposed to expedite claims. It was supposed to uh, give people like Mr. Smith an opportunity to be able to get well and to move forward. But before you go on, since I have Mr. Smith here, Mr. Smith, what do you think of this testimony? I'm just curious. This is your case. Thank you, sir. The, the, the uh, time's expired, but the gentleman may uh, respond to the question. Thank you very much, Take Mr. Chairman. Take the time that you need. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Uh, Mr. Cummings. My question for uh, AIG pointed out, increasing the funding for the Department of Labor, increasing that area. My question to you, sir, is, what good would that do? Because you don't listen to what they say anyway. I have documented proof where AIG has ignored the recommendations of the Department of Labor. And then we have to continue to go through legislation 
again and again and again. So the Department of Labor is fine, sir. Your company is not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ernest will uh, permit AIG to uh, respond briefly. Yeah. We have not been sitting on Mr. Smith's, excuse me, we have not been sitting on Mr. Smith's claim and refusing to pay and making arbitrary de decisions. Mr. Smith? Uh, Sir, I have documentation of it. You want to submit uh, documentation in this committee? It's in my session. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Schrader. I would, would like to, to add that we've paid over half a million dollars on Mr. Smith's case in medical and indemnity to date. There are no medical bills outstanding today. Well, was that the total of your bills, Mr. Smith? That's indemnity as well. That's uh, no, sir, that's, that was not the total. That's a, a falsification. They have not paid my doctors in full. Uh, they have paid what they thought was acceptable. And I have proof, I have documentation where they paid for services on a particular date when they cut the check to the doctor it was less than half, and in some cases, just a small percentage of what the, that was actually owed. If he wants to ask me about it, I have that documentation, and I will provide that to the, to the committee. Do you want to, uh, now, do you have that documentation, Mr. Shader? I, I don't have it, and I would be more than happy to. Do you, you, want, to, do you want to give it to him right Smith. now? Yeah, just, you want to make, do you have copies of that? If, if, that, if that's in the record, we have to make sure that since uh, Mr. Smith is referencing it, Mr. Shader is entitled to I, copies of it. I, I would like to add an addition. And if you want to examine those t later, examine them now, and if you want to comment on them later, you'll be permitted to do that. Thank you. Okay, I, so we're going we're gonna to move on. Okay, okay well, you'll, you'll get a chance to respond. Okay. But I think you ought to examine the documents that he gives you, and then you can respond. We'll, we'll make sure you get the chance to do it. We're going to go to a second round of questions here. Um, Mr. Chairman. I apologize Mr. to Smith, the committee. Uh, excuse me? I apologize to the committee. I will make that available within the next 24 hours. Would, uh, you're saying you don't have her with you right now? No, sir. I left it in the hotel. Well, please room. make it available, and then we'll get it to Mr. Uh, Shader, is it? Shader, yes. And then we will uh, send uh, further questions from the subcommittee to you so that you have a chance to answer them in light of what uh, Mr. Smith has said. Is that fair? We'd be more than happy to do Is that, that fair? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Thank okay. You, uh, I, I want to get back to the uh, line of questioning that, that I was working on. Um, General Fay, you testified that CNA's average yearly profits for all of its uh, Defense-Based Act insurance from 2002 to 2007 was of, uh, I, excuse me, and I apologize, uh, the general lady from California, um, Ms. Watson, is entitled to uh, five minutes of question. And I, uh, thank you so I want to much, thank Mr. The Chairman. Lady. Please proceed. Uh, I know you're on a roll here, and I no. Don't the general mind lady's entitled to her five minutes. To you. Go ahead. No, you, please, please go ahead. Because you're going down the same line, I would go down. But I want to thank the gentleman who had been out protecting our country for coming here in such a civil way, and explaining what has happened to you. I think it's reprehensible that the insurance companies would hold up or delay. I think your kinds of cases should be number one. And to have to come here and testify in public to get the insurance company to take a deeper look at your request, I think is just an injustice to those of you who've been securing our own country. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience. Uh, listening to your testimony, if you cannot be compensated for your wounds, both emotionally and physically, I don't suspect uh, contractors, families get any compensation for what they have. And I'll direct this to Mr. Pitts. Yes, uh, I know that in our uh, U.S. government uh, contractors and subcontractors uh, law, there was no reference to a contractor's family members or dependents except for the instance of compensation benefits for survivors of covered workers who were killed on the job. Is there any way to assist the families and the loved ones of <coughs> these victims? Beyond the death benefits? Yes, beyond the death benefits. <laughs> Those the, that are alive. 
and still um, suffer? Well, I, I think if, if their husbands were taken care of correctly, that would be the best benefit. But there is no benefit. For there, there's no, no, there's no benefit. I mean, unless a contractor uh, dies as a result of his work over there, uh, there's no benefits that go to the, the surviving spouse or the minor children. So they would have to seek private insurance. Uh, you know, when these gentlemen come home, yes. there's care that has to be given. There's uh, services that have to be given. Yes, ma'am. Uh, food, clothing, and shelter, and right. so there's no way for them to be covered for these there, expenses? In, in rare instances, there have been cases where I've been able to get some uh, compensation for, let's say, a wife that has to leave her job to come home to take care of her husband because he's so badly injured he, he can't take care of himself. So there have been cases where we've been able to get, um, you know, compensation through the judges to do that. I was listening very closely to your recommendations you. of how we should close these gaps. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we might want to, uh, from this subcommittee and our hearings, uh, recommend uh, legislation and policy that will not only cover the victims themselves, but their families as well. Because I don't care whether they have to work and come home it still is a burden on them to have someone who has not been compensated for their illnesses, their providers have not been compensated fully yet. So I think that this is something, Mr. Chairman, that could grow out of the testimony here. Uh, I would think that uh, all of those recommendations that you made should include conversation, and I'd like for you to, I think they were in your testimony, the recommendations, Mr. Pitts? Um, about, about basically um, making sure that the, the recommendations. Yes, yeah, the, the, the second one about making sure the widow knows, you know, that there is such a thing as the Defense Space Act and, and that she may have a claim for her family because I'm afraid otherwise there's going to be some really injustices out there because they just don't know any better. I mean, I, you know, if you're in a small town in, you know, Texas, what's the chance? I mean, your husband's a truck driver. He goes to work to support the troops over there. He, he dies. And so what's the chance that you're going to figure out there's such a thing as the Defense Space Act and, and, and to fill out the right death claim form to file it with the New York office, you know, in a timely way? That's just a gap that shouldn't be, and the employer should have some obligation to get her acknowledgement she's been told about this. That's, I think that's reasonable. The gentleman to your left, are they your clients? No, also? they're... Um, uh, Toby, what's his name? Cole. Tobias. Yes, to Toby Cole, uh, who's an attorney in Houston also. What I'd like to see you do, and you gentlemen too, I recommend to us how we can better the system so the benefits can reach out to the people they're intended to. These are contractors. They might not have been fighting, but they were in theater. And we owe them that. And I have been with insurance companies since the point at which they just, you know, uh, kick you out because your claims have been too large. I've been through that myself. But uh, we want to improve the system, and particularly this bogus war that we fought over in Iraq. And uh, these gentlemen went over to assist. And they should be treated like this after their severe inju injuries. So. Uh, this hearing is to collect the information, and I hope, Mr. Chairman, that we will end up with uh, some recommendations to put into a policy. And with that, I yield back. I already you, have the red light. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair will uh, begin the second round of questioning, five minutes. Bill, for just a second, uh, 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 yeah, uh, you were consulting with staff, but I would hope that out of our hearings would grow some policy that we can give to the full committee dealing with insurance and insurance claims and so on. Our, 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 uh, 
role as a uh, committee of government oversight and reform. We do oversight and reform. And so uh, we'll work with uh, the mm -hmm. general lady, with the uh, ranking member, Mr. Jordan, Mr. Mr. Cummings, and every member of this committee, because we do want to change this, no question about it. But before you change it, so that you know the direction you're going, you have to find out what happened. We have to do some forensics here. And the forensics may not be pretty. General Fay, you've testified that CNA's average yearly profits for all its uh, Defense Base Act insurance from 2002 to 2007 was 14.6 percent and only 9 percent from 2009. Now, isn't it true, however, that you have failed to mention that CNA's profits for all of its Department of Defense uh, Defense Base Act business, where CNA contracts directly with defense contractors, the business under scrutiny today, that those profits are over 50 percent per year as based on uh, documents that uh, were produced from this committee and I believe obtained from you. Yes, Chairman. The uh, truth of the matter, the facts are that on that uh, non-program business, which is the business that we at CNA uh, agree with all the recommendations, that that's the line of business that should be changed and that, in fact, the DBA program should be written under a program business. But when you said 14 percent, I just want to clarify, the, I, I want to clarify the record here because it's about numbers. You gave some numbers in your testimony. When you said it's only uh, 14 percent, isn't that the profit number for all of your DBA business, including the single risk pool programs with agencies other than DOD? Yes, that's correct. Thank it's you. Now, all I, of them I, taken together. Okay, and yes, I just sir. want to make sure that uh, we, um, uh, that we put that in the record and without objection uh, we'll enter uh, the uh, record uh, statement and the uh, records from uh, CNA which state that a projected combined ratio uh, for, um, for profit was 50 percent. Th that's on the non-program business thank, only. Thank you. That's the subject of Only this hearing. Only 3% of the, way, of the general, market. I, you know, the subject, that is the subject of this hearing. 50% profit, and we're hearing some, some, some witnesses. It may give us an idea why you have 50% profit. Now, now, with AIG, we agree it should be Shea, changed. you have uh, touted AIG's handling of your PTSD claims in your testimony and in documents provided to the subcommittee. Yet, are you aware that AIG has repeatedly utilized the expert testimony of a psychiatrist to review and ultimately reject PTSD claims of insured civilian contractors who were injured, who freely, uh, uh, who freely and repeatedly admits both under oath uh, and to reporters that uh, he is uh, neither an expert on PSD nor on MMP-12. No, I'm not sure who you're referring to. I'm, I'm referring, actually, are you an expert on uh, PTSD? No, as I, I'm not. As a matter of fact, I, one thing I do want to say about that is I had talked to the Labor Department a year, uh, two and a half years ago about sharing and reaching out for expert assistance from the VA, who I think does have the best uh, cadre of experts. And I do want to say that it may surprise Mr. Pitts, but I actually endorse completely his recommendation on the handling of PTS. D cases. Uh, Mr. Pitts, have you experienced with Dr. Griffith? Yes. And you want to tell us about that experience? Well, um, basically, uh, the vast, vast majority of uh, people that he's seen, he says, don't have PTSD. You want to hold that mic closer? Yes. We're having trouble yes, hearing. Yes, excuse you. me. Uh, the vast majority, um, he says, don't have PTSD. He has reservations about whether there is such a thing. Did they repeatedly find, in your experience, that claimants were malingerers? Normally. Do, do they, uh, do they uh, routinely, um, uh, do they use real experts in evaluating PTSD? Well, uh, Dr. Griffith has said that he's not an expert in the MMPI-2, which is uh, the multi Minnesota Multiphasic Inventory, which is a sort of a psychological battery that, that the courts are relying on. Do you employ Dr. Griffith, Mr. Shader? Yes, we do. do. Don't you think you should be employing a real expert well, in this would, illness rather like than a self-described non-expert? I would like the opportunity to send to the committee Dr. Griffith's credentials. Well, is I it, don't it, agree that he is not an expert in this area. Is he a skeptic of mental illness? I don't believe so. 
uh, then how do you explain the number of uh, denials that you've had and claims for PTSD? PTSD is a very difficult phenomenon to uh, diagnose and prescribe treatment for, and it isn't, even when it exists, it doesn't always prohibit or inhibit somebody from holding gainful employment, which is really what in Well, this, this subcommittee, if it hasn't already, will ask uh, AIG for its uh, records on the rate of denials of uh, application for claims for, um, uh, for PTSD. Uh, we will also ask both CNA and AIG uh, for information and internal documents and memos and, um, uh, and, and emails relating to the, um, the relationship between your claim denials and your profits. So you'll be getting a formal letter from the committee. I just want to uh, let you know right now that we'll be coming. The chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Moore, what, what percentage of the claims that you receive are uh, PTSD uh, claims? Or Mr. Shader? Uh, I'm just curious. We don't have precise numbers on that because we don't track that as a characteristic. I would estimate it about 20 percent. Same, same percent that Mr. Cases, Pitt yes. said he, the yeah. type of cases he brings. So is that yeah. consistent with you too, Mr. Yeah. Fay? Yeah. I really, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I really do not know what the percentage is. I just know that on those very few cases that went to administrative law judges, only uh, two of them were PTSD, and uh, we prevailed in one, and the uh, claimant prevailed in one. Okay. Um, let me change gears here. It, one, of the, one of the questions I have from you, it's been alleged that companies are denying claims for fear that they will not be reimbursed under the War Hazards Compensation Act. Is there any truth to that? Have you had any uh, where the government hasn't reimbursed you uh, for a war-related um, Injured. We've submitted about $42 million of claims under, that we had paid before certification under the War uh, has its Compensation Act and have to this date only received $3 million. Wow. Has that impacted your decision in, in how you've handled the cases that come, no. claims come in front of you? Mr. Fay. Um, the War Hazards Act people are actually a small group. We're talking four or five mm -hmm. people in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and their job is basically to protect the taxpayer from bad War Hazards Act claims. So they're sort of skeptics. So if there's a gray area, they're going to deny the claim or there's mm -hmm. an impetus to, which makes sense. They, mm -hmm. That's their job. However, PTSD by its nature, you could say is fuzzy. So it's an assured, I mean, it's something that would be, makes sense. If you're an insurance company, you've got this fuzzy claim and you want to get your money back, drag it out, litigate it. If you lose, there's going to be a judicial holding. This is from the war. Then you know you're going to get your money back. Then you also get to turn in your attorney's fees and uh, get the 15 percent. So that's what's going on. I mean, from my point of view, that's my opinion. Uh, Mr. Pitts, let me, let me stick with you on, on, on an issue that I brought up earlier and I think coincides with your testimony. You, you suggest employers, you know, get a signed written statement and put, put families on notice and, and, about DBA benefits. Um, DynCorp has this uh, Civilian Police Employee Assistance Program. Your they thoughts on that, that, that kind of program and if that's something we should encourage, Department of Labor should encourage with contractors they're doing business with. KBR also has the with. Employee Assistance Program to something, some part of the war, I think, where they were paying for like eight visits or something to a psychologist. I'm not sure if they're still doing that. I, I don't see so many people do it now. Okay, well, okay, so that's in some instances they were doing something like that. DynCorp, I have to say, was proactive about PTSD and uh, some of the other things. Uh, I really think they deserve some credit for that. Mr. Newman, is, uh, can you like to comment? Yes, sir. I mean, uh, we, we started the uh, simple uh, employee assistance program to, 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 for several reasons, to bridge the gap with the insurance carriers because we thought the gap was bridgeable. Um, in reality, even the, even the, the request that that uh, we would make of the of the uh, insurance car carriers oftentimes were totally ignored. But uh, I was discussing with a colleague actually from DynCorp, he was early, here earlier today, uh, about that issue of, of almost a, a national employee assistance program or something to that effect, or encouraging the, you know, the employers, not the insurance companies, of having that type of program. And, we offer, or at DynCorp, I can still consider it we, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, we have a psychological staff that regardless of whether it's a, 
a covered claim or what, they still provide some psychological services for post-traumatic stress. And, uh, and I, I, do, uh, I do want to comment on post-traumatic stress. I deter the, that, it's, that it's fuzzy. It's pretty clear when you, when you actually see it. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Can, Smith I, can I clarify that on the fuzzy? What I mean is legally fuzzy in the sense that the insurance company can always say, well, it's personal problems. How do we know it comes from the war? And they are afraid that the war hazards people are going to see it as fuzzy and deny their claim. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it hedges their bet com tremendously to just go ahead and litigate all this stuff out, which is bad on the country, it increased cost, it's just, it's wrong. But that's why structurally it's happening. Yes, yes sir, I, I want to apologize to Mr. Pitts for referring to his comment of fuzzy. I was more referring to the I comments of malingering, et cetera. Just the lawyers are getting nervous, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. Maybe we'll see for Mr. five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't think I'm going to use all my time. I, I just want to say to uh, the, to you, Mr. Newman, Mr. Smith, Mr. Woodson, I want to thank you for your service. Um, sometimes I think people can get confused and um, not do everything that they're supposed to do for people who give so much. And uh, we, we got to straighten out this mess. Uh, you heard uh, Mr. Seth Harris say that we got major problems and they need to be corrected. Um, and you even heard some of these witnesses imply, at least. Uh, I, know you, I know how you feel, Mr. Pitts, but some of my other witnesses, too, that we got we to straighten this out. And, um, and we're going to do that. And because we can be in a situation where you continue to suffer, get no real relief, and the beat goes on, the AIGs of the world continue to get their bonuses and go on their junkets, and the CNAs, no matter what the general may say, goes on doing their thing, but then you're left to suffer. We can do better than that. We're a better country than that particularly when you consider the fact that the hard-earned dollars of our constituents are paying into these insurance companies and they cannot lose. You understand that? The way this thing is structured, they can't lose, which, which makes it almost criminal. The idea that when they, they get our money, that's number one, then they're supposed to take care of you, and if they don't, then they don't. Then you suffer, and they get rich. Boy, what a game. What a game. And so some kind of way we've got to turn this around. And so we, you know, we have a very committed chairman of our full committee, uh, Mr. Towns. We have a very very dedicated and hardworking and, dedic and just a strong chairman of this committee, subcommittee, Mr. Kucinich, and I know we'll have our rankings hopefully joining in because this is, this is an American problem. This is not a Republican and Democrat. This is American. This is, this is, this is what you, I mean, if you're talking about being patriotic, you, we take care, this country take care, takes care of its own. This is, we, we have become the, the great country that we are because of our moral authority. Not so much the military authority, it may back up the moral, but it is the moral authority. And one part of moral authority is that you take care of your own, period. And so I want to thank you for your testimony, and Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield back on that. I, I thank the uh, gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentlelady. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have to read part of my opening statement because I think it goes right to the reason why we had this hearing. In 2008, there were 200,000 civilian contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there were more civilian contractors than there were U.S. troops in both combat theaters combined. And the contractors' presence in these combat zones go primarily under the radar, and very little is reported on the number of injuries 
they sustain due to the service they provide in aiding the federal government in its mission. And as of June of 2008, more than 1,350 contractors have died in Iraq and Afghanistan, and there was another 25, uh, 29,000 injured, and more than 8,300 of them were serious uh, permanent injuries. And so, as the number of Defense Base Act claims rise for compensation due to injury or death of a contractor, the payments on the amount of compensation benefits paid per claim have dropped to their lowest level since 2003. And I'm wondering how this can be with the high levels of injuries that are being sustained by contractors themselves. And Mr. Smith, I don't understand ignored. You know, how could they ignore the claim? Can you explain what you mean by ignored? Uh, yes, ma'am. The Department of Labor would make a uh, finding uh, in an informal hearing. That's the first step in the process of litigation. And they, I'm sorry, ma'am, I don't know any way to put it. They absolutely ignore the Department of Labor finding. They the do. Department of Labor then. Yes, ma'am. Secretary. In my, yes, ma'am. In my case. Yeah. In my case, they. I want they, you to know, Secretary Hilda Solis said there's a new sheriff in town. Yes, ma'am, and I understand that, and I, I'm I'm proud to hear that, and I I thank this committee for, for uh, stepping up and and taking the ball, but. In my case, that is exactly what's happened. And in my opening statement, I have the proof uh, in the documentation. Yes, well, I hope that uh, you will share those uh, papers and your documentation with Mr. Schrader. Yes, ma'am. And Mr. Moore. I will and, provide uh, that to this committee who can then Thank you as soon as possible. And Within 24 that, hours, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma with that, I'll defer the rest of my time, Mr. Chairman, to you. I, I thank the uh, general lady. The committee uh, submitted for the record information that AIG had a uh, net earned premium from the government of $1.3 trillion. 2002 to 2000, strike that, billion, $1.3 billion, that's $1.3 billion in net earned premium from 2002 to 2007, and underrating gains of $500 million for a 38 percent gain. Now, Mr. Woodson. You lost a leg, and you lost almost all of your eyesight. I lost the sight of my. Could you put that? Uh, give them the microphone. The microphone. I, I lost the sight of my left eye, three fourths of my right, and I lost my left leg. Uh, at the present time, I'm using a magnifier to try to read. AIG will not even pay for the glasses that the doctor has ordered back in April. Net earned premium, $1.3 billion, underwriting gains, $500 million, 38% gain. Mr. Moore, when you hear this, do you feel any, any sense of regret or concern about what Mr. Woodson has gone through? Do you, what is, how does this make you feel? Mr. Chairman, there's no doubt when, when you hear something like this and you, and you see something like that and- P Please speak into the mic I'm so we can I'm hear sorry. you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, there's no doubt that when you hear something like this and, and with any of these gentlemen and what they've done and served the country, that you do have a feeling towards it. My job is to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly should do 
and that we are obligated to do under the current regulations and the laws to provide the right care for these individuals, and that's what, what Mr. Shader. But you're telling you're telling Mr. Woodson that you did everything you could for him. Is that what you're telling him? Is that your testimony? No, my testimony. I haven't personally done everything I can for him. I, I don't know. I'm just saying the, the that the your company AIG yes. has done everything it could. Okay. You want Is that is that your testimony? Mr. Shader, you want to answer? That? Yes. The answer is yes, I, it is everything that we could have done. And just as an example, and I don't know where the communication is failing, um, but on the glasses prescription that was written and submitted to us on 42809, it was approved the same day. They have never paid for it. Mr. They still Woodson. have the glasses. Mr. Woodson, you say they never paid for it? Ne never have paid for see, it. See, this is, this is the reason why we brought these witnesses here. These are people who are part of the hundreds of thousands of contractors who are insured through a variety of companies with the government making sure that you get, get money to pay claims. And when you don't pay claims, what happens when insurance companies don't pay claims? Typically, the profits are higher. That's our concern here. Our, our concern as a committee is that uh, Mr. Newman, who uh, lost a leg, Mr. Smith, who suffers from PTSD, Mr. Woodson, who lost his eyesight, most of it, and has a prosthetic leg, that each and every one of them represents not just the three of them, but they stand for many more who served America as private contractors who were injured and sometimes killed, who cannot get any justice because, look, if you're the insurance company, you deny a claim, they're already at a disadvantage to, to fight you. If you defer paying a claim, you could drag it out. How, how long did it take you, Mr. Newman, to get your uh, leg? Would you go speak into the mic? How long did it get your, your new prosthetic leg? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, the newest one, it took over 550 days. 560 days. Is that, is that, you, you know, is that acceptable? It can't be acceptable. I just, so the committee's going to go further into this. I just want you to know we, we're going to have to move on to votes here. I'm going to, you know, every person here who is asked to testify will be continuing to stay in touch with the committee and the committee with you. You'll all be given a chance to get your, your testimony into the record of this hearing. But we're going to pursue this more because if, the, if these three gentlemen, with the grievous injuries that they've suffered, can come here in front of a congressional t uh, committee and take an oath to their testimony, and then we find out that there's this disconnect between payment of their claims and satisfying them so their lives can be made whole. Because let me just tell you something. You gentlemen, General Fay, Mr. Moore, Mr. Shader, you're going to walk out of here uh, with your two natural legs. You're going to walk out of here, not needing assistance to see where you're going. You're going to go home, and you won't be troubled by flashbacks about combat. You don't have to contend with what these gentlemen have had to contend with and what many others who serve the country as contractors have had to contend with. So that's why we're holding these hearings. And this isn't about you personally, but you stand for institutions that we have to find a way to make them more responsive. I want to, uh, 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 the general lady's time has expired and I'm going to just wrap this committee meeting up, um, putting into the record that CNA's net earned premiums from 2002 to 2007 were uh, $110,722,000. Uh, million, uh, their underwriting claims were $58 million. Uh, their percent of gain uh, was 53%. Uh, uh, we have others that are involved too. Uh, I want to um, put into the record this memorandum from staff. It's an exchange regarding the source of a majority memo that was res uh, referenced by Mr. Fay's testimony. Uh, this committee operates under the rules of the House, and the rules are pretty strict with respect to uh, the gathering of information and, and the uh, production of, of records. Uh, Major General Fay, a witness for CNA, made explicit reference to the majority staff's memorandum to members, which is a non 
public document prepared for subcommittee members in advance of a hearing. Chairman Kucinich, and this is uh, prepared by the staff here for this here, uh, just now, Chairman Kucinich asked General Fay how he obtained a copy of the committee memo. General Fay responded that a member of his legislative staff provided it to him. She and a colleague were identified and approached the witness table. Uh, Heather Davis was sworn in. When asked how she obtained the majority's memorandum, Ms. Davis said that General Fay may have been in error and that the, source, uh, that the source to him of the memo was either herself or her male colleague. Uh, she said that she obtained the memo from committee staff. She, asked, uh, she was asked if it was a Democratic committee staff member who provided the, the memo. Uh, the male colleague responded that it was not a Democratic committee staff member who gave the uh, committee memo, uh, memo to CNA. Uh, this uh, uh, subcommittee, uh, well, this is essentially an internal matter. It was made external because of the fact that you, General Fay, received information that rightfully should not have been in your possession. Uh, we will uh, investigate that further, and uh, our attorneys will be in touch with uh, uh, you and your staff regarding this matter. I also want to say that uh, in response, and, I, and I, by the way, I want the uh, uh, majority staff to know that I showed uh, Mr. Um, Jordan uh, these remarks that I'm about to read into the record. Uh, in response to the comment of the ranking member, I would like to correct the record. The, major the majority has extended the customary accommodations to the minority, including the subject of the hearing, a detailed briefing memo on the subject matter the contact information of all witnesses, and the right to invite a witness. Uh, if the minority had difficulty preparing its members for this hearing in spite of this considerable assistance, then we look forward to working with you to try to find out how we can make this work for you because uh, we value your cooperation and we want to make sure that, um, uh, that you have every opportunity to uh, prepare for these hearings in a way that you feel is important uh, for, for those that you serve. Because I. I value greatly uh, uh, the work of staff on both sides. I want to uh, thank uh, each and every witness here. As difficult as it uh, was for CNA and for AIG to be here, uh, we do need your help in trying to straighten this out. And this is not simply a private sector matter. I just spent uh, the last uh, six years trying to get the Defense Finance Administration uh, to um, Away from, a, away from a privatization program that Lockheed Martin had that was similarly denying people their claims for one, what, whatever reason. So this is something that we see some systemic problems. Um, in our conversations that were detailed with, with Lockheed Martin, uh, we found uh, that the best solution for them was to simply uh, give the business back to the government, which I think they were glad to do. Uh, in your case, uh, uh, because they weren't making money on it, uh, at least uh, uh, they weren't making as, uh, as much money as, as you are. I want to thank um, uh, Mr. Newman for, again, and Mr. Smith and Mr. Woodson for your service to the country. Your presence here represents a lot of uh, uh, people who were private contractors who served. And I think that everyone here, uh, whatever their position on, uh, on this dais and whatever their position uh, uh, in the audience, appreciates that you served appreciates the price that you pay. And, they, and I think everybody's going to take a renewed interest, I would hope, that a renewed interest is going to be taken in your situation, but then to expand to the larger question. Uh, Mr. Pitts, thank you for your service as well. I, I, again, I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, we will be in touch with all of you. This is the Would you yield for a second? I will yield to the gentlelady, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, the reason why I read my opening statement, uh, some paragraphs from there, because I stated uh, some of the numbers and so we will submit that, too, to go along with the report. So we'll, we'll uh, have the numbers. The, the, the record of this hearing will remain open for uh, five uh, legislative days. Great. And the general lady's um, uh, submission uh, will be valued and uh, gratefully received. Uh, and I just want to make sure that I uh, submitted this uh, for the record from uh, uh, this uh, calculation of profits that uh, was that's from CNA. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the general lady. I also thank uh, her for her willingness to uh, work with us in crafting a legislative solution. The representative from the Department of Labor, Labor said uh, it's really up to us, and we do have a responsibility here to look at this legislatively, and we're going to. Uh, this is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. I'm Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Subcommittee. It's a Subcommittee of Government Overs uh, Oversight and Reform. Uh, this has been a hearing that has dealt with 
uh, the, the issues of, uh, of claims uh, not being paid, the reasons why that could happen, and uh, what could be done in the future to uh, rectify that. I want to uh, once again thank all the uh, witnesses for their appearance. So we'll continue to be in touch with you. Uh, this committee stands adjourned. Thank you.